Now, I've never had so much fun filling out application forms as I do now. Every single time, it's like reliving a childhood dream. Name, Kevin Jagger. Birth date, June 6th, 1984. Occupation, athlete. How cool is that? Now, while I'm thrilled with my current profession, I do find it sometimes leaves others uh, feeling almost like I'm a little bit lost or I don't know where I'm headed in life. Uh, and to give you an, an example of what I'm talking about, the uh, cab ride here from the airport is a perfect example. Grab my bags, threw them in the back seat, start making small talk with the, with the cab driver, and uh, eventually says, you know, so what do you do? I'm a speed skater, I say. Uh, oh, wow. You know, you, obviously, you don't hear that too often. Um, and you can just see his kind of, his eyes light up. Um, and, you know, his, his, uh, his next question is, you know, so you go to the last Olympics? No, I say. Uh, oh, Okay, he kind of averts his eyes in the rearview mirror looking at me, and now he's kind of focused back on the road ahead for the rest of our trip. Um, and I sit there kind of curious, you know, at the, the, the nature of his expectations. Imagine the same conversation, but change, um, change the profession. So what do you do? Well, you know, I'm a real estate agent. Oh, wow, are you among the top 30 real estate agents in the world? <laughs> no. Oh, well, good, you know, good for you. It's important to have a hobby. Good, good for you for doing it anyways. <laughs> Now, in sports especially, but not exclusively, we're all too focused on the result and not the pursuit. It's not that results are unimportant. It's that results don't transfer. Winning an Olympic gold medal in speed skating is not a prerequisite for any job I know. But the, the commitment to excellence, the passion required, the work ethic, all of those things, in, in uh, essence, the pursuit is what's valued. That will transfer to a number uh, of roles in sports and beyond. So we place all this value on the pursuit, but we focus on the result. Now, growing up, I played football, and I was fortunate enough to get a football scholarship to Montreal's McGill University. It was there that my social circle began to expand a little bit beyond the football field, and I started to get curious, you know, what is it like kind of life after school, life after football, uh, you know, as my mom would say, the real world? What, what are these people doing? And, you know, it seemed the best and brightest were headed to Wall Street to become investment bankers. I had... No idea what that meant, but people seemed to be pretty pumped when they were talking about it. So I looked into it. I was taking business classes. And, you know, it seemed like this is kind of what I'm here to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. Um, you know, this is something I should seriously look at. So I met with kind of any bank that came on campus, went to the, went to the job sessions, um, applied online, and then I shifted my focus away from football. I needed to, uh, you know, dedicate my time to get my grades up. So I worked like crazy and got my grades up. And after interviewing with dozens of banks uh, from all over North America, I got exactly one job offer. And I can still remember um, the, the phone call and, and getting the offer. And I, I got razzed for a long time while I was at work. I was the only analyst they'd ever heard of uh, that accepted the job on the phone. Uh, I guess you're, you're supposed to kind of Tell them you'll, you'll take some time to think about it, pretend like you have some options. Uh, all, all I could see was the, the Monopoly card in my head, bank error in your favor. And I wanted to snatch that, that opportunity while it was on the table. Now, I got, I got into banking, and um, they, they kind of impressed upon me that it was very important, this year-end bonus thing. You needed to fit into the top bucket. There's three buckets. It's curious to say that we're kind of working for our, bu uh, our bonus. I'm 21 years old, I have an entry-level job, and I have a salary that's already six figures. So, you know, what, what, could that, what could that matter? But, you know, it seemed to be a very big deal. So we'd be grouped, of the 600 worldwide analysts, of whom I was one, we'd be ranked into three buckets. Top 10%, middle 80%, bottom 10%. And the top 10%, if you wanted mobility, a promotion, basically, you know, if you wanted anything, you needed to be in this top bucket, and you could expect a bonus in excess of 100% of our base salary. So I said, all right, that's, that's what I'm doing. That is, a, one year from now, I will be a top bucket analyst. Uh, I do not want to feel like I don't belong here. I want to kind of prove to myself that I can be here. So I gave up absolutely everything uh, chasing that result, uh, completely ignorant to what that pursuit was costing me. I missed every family dinner, uh, every vacation, every anniversary, every uh, birthday with my girlfriend. Uh, working seven days a week, and um, it was just this idea that, you know, that was me slogging away. <laughs> and at the, at the end of my first year, I was in fact awarded top bucket. I traded away 364 days of agony for one day of glory. 
did the exact same thing in my second year, and I would have done the same thing in my third, uh, but 2008 rolled around, and I, I learned uh, you know, a very valuable lesson. I learned what I like to call a multi-million dollar lesson for the cost of a few thousand dollars. As part of my bonus, I received some shares of Citigroup. I received these shares at $55 a share. Since then, they've done a one for 10 stock split, so that's $550. Uh, when I got them at $55, I watched the value of those shares fall to 75 cents. I felt, you know, kind of robbed. Um, I was under the impression if I worked X, I would receive Y. Y had now drastically changed, but X, that, that hadn't budged. I didn't get to go back and go to all those dinners I missed, open presents with my nieces and nephews on uh, Christmas morning, blow up the candles with my girlfriend on her birthday. That had come and gone, and uh, the kind of pursuit had come and gone, and the result which I was entirely focused on, was not what I thought it was going to be. Now, fa sorry, fast forward to 2010. Jumped ahead here a little bit. Fast forward to 2010, and I'm in Vancouver watching the Vancouver Olympics. And I'm no longer with Citigroup, but I'm working in corporate development for a, a, a U.S. media firm. That's me watching, uh, beer in hand, watching Team Canada. And... You know, I'm watching the Olympics, I'm hearing story after story of all these athletes who have pretty amazing stories. They've all believed in themselves, they've chased big dreams, and now they're here showcasing their talents on the world stage. And I'm sitting there, six years removed from doing any sports, you know, quite a nice beer got on me, and I'm thinking, what happened? What, what happened? I, I grew up, I was going to be a professional football player, that it was, you know, a foregone conclusion. I, why did I give that up halfway through college to get a head start on being an adult? Um, you know, it's not, it's not like you get to make that decision and say, you know what, I'm going to do the banking thing and I'm going to make money, and then next life, that athlete thing I want to do, I'll do that then, and I'll have tons of time for it. It doesn't work that way. You kind of get, you get one shot. And so, you know, the way I saw it, I was standing at the, the Ferris wheel of life, and, you know, it gets one rotation, and, and one of those, there's different buckets for everything, and one of them is the athlete bucket, and I'm standing at the, the base of the, of the Ferris wheel, and the athlete bucket has kind of come down, swooped down, and it's now headed on its way back up soon out of sight, not to come back. And I'm standing in my suit with my briefcase, and I'm thinking, I, I, you know, I've got a decision to make. Um, do I let it go and just say, you know what, that, that dream wasn't for me. Uh, if, it, if it was for me, it would have happened. Or do I drop what I'm doing and just chase after it like all hell and see if I can catch it? So I chose the latter. I chose to give myself a chance and say, you know, what can I do with four years? No excuses. If I worked and dedicated myself to this, how far could I go? So uh, the, you know, the pursuit was now established, trained to become a top level athlete, but what sport? So I did what any kid does nowadays before they're about to start a term paper, went to Wikipedia. And uh, coming fresh off the Winter Olympics, I, I guess you know, I, I had a Winter Olympic um, you know, dream. I, had a, I wanted to do a Winter Olympic sport. So I printed off the list of Winter Olympic sports. If I didn't know what I was going to be good at or what I wanted to do, at the very least, I'll start with what I don't want to do and what I'm not going to be good at. So I, I did a simple process of elimination. No team sports. 25 years old, I'm simply too old. Nothing judged. Didn't like the idea of giving up control to somebody else. No skiing sports. I could not afford the one-on-one -on -one coaching and to kind of live on a mountain. Um, I never touched a luge, uh, bobsled, or skeleton sled, uh, so that, that was kind of out. And it left one sport with, with, two, um, with two disciplines, long and short track. And being 25 years old, 6'1", 230 pounds, I wanted to see if maybe one sport lend itself better to that than, uh, than the other. So it didn't take long to realize I was about five years too old and about 70 pounds too heavy for short track speed skating. So long track it was. That was going to be my pursuit. And I felt good about it because... You know, I've, I've played hockey as a kid. I've skated. You know, I've, I've got the motion down. I got the idea. I, I have some sort of concept of how this is going to go, even though, you know, this is what I looked like the last time I played hockey. <laughs> so my, uh, my foray into skating, my foray into skating did not exactly have a fairy tale beginning. And I know you think of Bobby Boucher when you think of fairy tale. So this is Adam Sandler in the, uh, the Water Boy and Seabiscuit. The idea there is that they were great football player and, and racehorse long before they ever did it. The, the issue was they needed a chance. It was not the same for me. Um, it wasn't a situation where, you know what, I just need to put skates on, throw me out on the ice, and this is going to be a thing of beauty. I should have been a speed skater my entire life. <laughs> my, uh, my origins had much humbler beginnings. I remember my, my, uh, my first day on ice, 
I go to an open house. I'm just kind of hungry to get you know, any ice time I can get. And I, I, get, I borrow a pair of skates, and this is a sport where the skates are entirely custom. So I am wedged into somebody else's boots. I've shoveled my 230 pounds into a full-length, skin-tight speed suit. Speed at this point is a, is a very relative term. And I go out on my first day, and I start you know, doing whatever I can, eventually just trying to get my hands off the boards. And at one point, I do a, an all-out lap, what we call a tempo. And I finish, and I, I probably look like Bambi going around. I look up to the coach, just kind of hungry to hear an odd time or something, something that I can uh, reference point. And he looks down at the watch, looks back at me, don't worry about times. Times aren't important, which is you know, interesting. It's a, it's a sport entirely based on time. <laughs> but at the end of my first day, I was not the slowest person there, which I was pretty pumped about. It's, but it might have had something to do with, uh, of the 30 or so people there, I was the only one above the age of 10. So switching, switching from a career in finance to chasing an, Olympic, uh, you know, chasing an Olympic sport at a top level and a sport I'd never done before, I learned the not so subtle difference between being in the 1% and the first percentile. Now, undeterred, I decided from here on out, I'm going full speed ahead. So I, I quit my job and dedicated myself to training, overhauled my nutrition, started training twice a day, six days a week. And I looked ahead at what a, you know, where do I need to be four years from now is I want to get into a national team trials. What do I need to do today, this afternoon, to get there? What, what's the next big milestone? I'm not focusing, I don't even know what I'm doing yet. So why would I focus so far down? And it, it came down to the fact that I needed to make the Oval program, which is a team out of Calgary, a, a high performance team. So trained for four months, lost over 40 pounds, flying back and forth between Vancouver and Calgary to get any ice time I could get and I got my times down and was accepted into the Oval Program. I was officially the Oval Program's newest, oldest, and slowest member. <laughs> now, I've been training, um, I've been in, on that team for two years, and being a former investment banker and former football player, I'm about as A-type as you can get. So, spending two years waking up at 5.30 in the morning, either biking or driving to the Oval, and getting my butt kicked by guys and girls 10 years younger than me has definitely been a humbling experience. But uh, the, you know, the work, the work is starting to pay off. Um, fast forward to, to today, and uh, I'm ranked among the top 70 speed skaters in Canada, and I compete on the, the national circuit, the Canada Cup. And you know, my dream, I don't fall asleep at night envisioning the, the Olympic podium. Um, for one, I don't think I've really earned that, but I, it's not even an issue. I've got so much to think about in the interim. Um, my, my dreams and my visions are focused on what am I doing tomorrow or the next day, uh, an element of training that up until now has given me trouble, trying to get through our hill sprints program without puking, adding, adding more wattage on the bike, hiking to a new altitude, uh, training with myself and my teammates, trying to achieve new personal bests. In other words, I'm so engrossed in the pursuit that I have a hard time looking too far down the line to the result. Looking back on my time banking, and I, I, do, I do not mean to portray banking in a negative light, but my experience certainly was. I, I went about it completely the wrong way. I wasn't focused on learning about the financial markets, expanding my knowledge of all these new industries, working with some of the smartest people I've ever met. I was focused on what do I need to do uh, to get top bucket. It's very similar to going to university and trying to learn and trying to get good grades. They're not the same thing. So I'm, I'm fortunate to be engaged in a passion and a passion of the pursuit and come at a time of social media where I can share that. I can share it daily, um, and I have a, a blog, longtracklongshot.com, which is aptly named, and uh, I've received millions of views from over 120 countries. I have an engaged social media platform that has now offered me an opportunity to um, attract and retain sponsors. I now act as a consultant for some of Canada's top Olympic athletes on their sponsorship. I work with uh, Canadian Sport Federation and even the Canadian Olympic Committee on basically bringing some of my knowledge from, from the business world, but also the idea that it is so much more than the result. It, people want to connect with the story, the pursuit, and that's you know, what I've been successful with sharing, and that's what I really hope to extend to all of these other athletes that I see sitting on a, you know, a wealth of content and uh, an inability to kind of feel passionate about it and share it and bring other people in on the journey. So the, the idea is that, um, you know, 
I have no idea what I'm going to fill out on my, my application forms later. I'm super pumped I can fill it out with Athlete right now, and I genuinely appreciate that, and I know it's not going to last. So I'll never regret starting down this journey because of that feeling, because of the ability to think, you know, today I got to go out and earn it. I got to go out and earn what I'm doing. So again, I don't know what's happening next, but I want it to give me that same feeling. You know, far from, um, far from going to work each day, and, you know, I treat it like a daily challenge. There's something usually each day that I'm either dreading or, or you know, looking forward to proving that the training and everything has been paying off. And that's what, you know, that's what life kind of should be. It's about tackling the daily challenges. It's not about treating it like time that just needs to pass between now and the, my next paycheck, my next bonus, or my next vacation. So I'll leave you with uh, a line from uh, an old football coach that said to me that, that has really stuck with me. We were in two-a-days, which is kind of summer, the end of summer training for football, and it's just grueling. It's, it's, you, know, you don't want to be there. It's hot out. It's the end of summer. You'd rather be doing a million other things. But in reality, that's the training that's going to separate you come kind of playoff time. And I think our coach had seen it. You know, our, our heads were wandering a little bit. And he said, uh, you know, don't count the days. Make the days count. So thank you very much.